And good evening. Welcome to the programme. Uh, your column today, while it left nobody in any doubt as to what you think, which is, of course, your trademark over the years, but you began by sharing a tweet from Rishi Sunak recently. Uh, please tell us what it said. Oh, it said uh, there should be no competition between friends. Uh, and, you know, if, if there's no competition, then we'll all innovate faster. No competition between friends. Now, you know, that is in itself a complete nonsense. It's why he is realigning us with the EU. Whereas I thought the whole purpose of Brexit was that we could compete with the EU. You can still stay friends and compete. As I said in my column, Rishi Shunak's politician, he's been competing all his life. Now, he must have been competing with friends occasionally. Otherwise, he's got an awful lot of enemies, is all I can say. You know, and it's normal for countries to compete. They compete in sport. They compete in business. They compete in exports. You can still say friendly and allied, but competition is for the benefit of your own country. And Rishi's just throwing that away. And, and never yet, is it more of it. We're oh. told, Anne, over and over that Rishi Sunak was a Brexiteer, but I have to say I never saw him on the campaign trail. No, well, he voted. He says he voted Brexit. Now, why did he vote Brexit? You know, what was it he believed? If he believed we should ditch the single market, why has he inflicted it on Northern Ireland? Uh, and actually, you know, contributing to the breakup of, I reckon, eventually of the UK uh, mm. by leaving Northern Ireland effectively, even if not legally, behind in the EU. Uh, yeah. Why did he, I, I, want, I, yeah, he I know. want to compete with the EU? Why did he vote Brexit? I wish he'd tell us. Well, I, yeah, I think because actually in his North Yorkshire constituency, there were so many small farmers who'd had enough of EU red tape that maybe he feared reselection. But moving on to an even more serious issue. Now, in 2014, I did a head to head debate with Nick Clegg, then Deputy Prime Minister, when I said one of the reasons I did not want to be member, a member of the European Union is I wanted no part in a European army. I thought NATO was the right defensive structure for us to be a very important part of. And I genuinely believed that by leaving the EU, we would stick to NATO and not European military structures. But the most important thing you wrote today was about the European Defence Union and our recent decision. Yes. I mean, no man can serve two masters. We're either in NATO or we're in the European Defence Union. Trying to serve both um, simply won't work, certainly not uh, in the medium to long term. Now, I'm quite happy to have some defence you know, cooperation uh, in the same way that America is. But America's got a loose agreement with the EU. We, as usual, are tying ourselves down to a whole load of conditions. Just listen to this one. We have to, this is in order to, to be a member of the fully fledged uh, union, uh, the defence union, we have to give an endorsement for EU expansion. Give an endorsement for EU expansion. And we're then told this, we have to agree to the EU's export restrictions for any capabilities or technologies created as a result of the involvement of a non-EU state. In other words, they will own the intellectual property uh, to everything we do. It is an absolute madness. Now, if we were going down the American route and saying, yes, you know, we'll have a non-legally binding uh, agreement with you uh, and uh, based on very loose principles, that's fine. Don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with, we've got to convince the EU of our suitability, our suitability, given what we contribute to NATO, our suitability uh, to belong to the European Defence Union. And when we've done that, then we enter into a legally binding agreement. Now, yeah, you know, and, of course, and of course, this will cover defence procurement as well. I mean, I'm yeah. so depressed about this because I was saying there were two big wins from Brexit. One was constitutional, we've actually left, we've reversed the status quo. We may not be happy with what the Tories have done with it, and many aren't, but it was at least a win. The other win, I believed, was in foreign policy, where we'd, you know, we'd done the AUKUS deal with Australia, taken the lead on Ukraine, whether you agree with the policy is irrelevant, we took the lead. Um, but this threatens, doesn't it, to destroy even oh. that? Totally. I mean, this would tie us into the EU and its rules uh, and its dominance, um, which I thought was the reason why we left. This would actually tie us in. And there's no need for it. 
we've got an a, a organization in NATO that has kept the peace, actually kept the peace ever since the Second World War. It doesn't have to prove itself. What on earth has the European Defence Union done that is even comparable? Yeah. Well, no. And, and I'm told that top brass are, are very, very unhappy with this, yeah. and yet the government has gone ahead. And I've been watching this with half an eye for months, years, worrying about whether this would happen. And your column in today's Express gave me the opportunity to air this and debate this. But let me ask you this. As somebody who's been around current affairs, debate, politics for a very long time, this is a very significant move. It, if you showed it to Brexit voters, you know, on their doorsteps, physically, the vast majority would be absolutely horrified. But let me ask you, as a long-time observer and engager in these debates, why is this not being discussed? Why are you and I here on GB News talking about this and no other channel or no other newspaper is? Well, I drew the analogy in my column today when Gordon Brown carried out a pensions yeah. raid based on some very technical thing called advanced corporation tax relief, which they all talk about that in the pig and whistle, don't they? Nobody understood what it was about. Uh, and so uh, they were able to go ahead and do it. And now this is exactly the same thing happening with the European Defence Union. People don't understand what it involves. It's too complicated. They don't want to hear from us any more than they wanted to hear from the Tories when the pensions raid was on. Mm. And it will be too late to discover what's happened uh, if this goes ahead. So we've got to somehow get this into the public consciousness and get it over in language that people can understand. Absolutely. Final thought, Anne. I mean, you called the Prime Minister a fool. That was a bit over the I mean, top, wasn't it? No. I mean, he is a fool on this. You know, I'm not saying he's a fool on absolutely everything. Of course he's not. Nobody's a fool on absolutely everything. But on this, he's a fool. I mean, it's like saying, I was a fool to do such and such. Rishi, you're a fool to do this.